road to Romans has wrecked me. It has absolutely revolutionized my life, my thinking, all of it. And I'm getting testimonies from all over the world about stuff that we've been seeing and didn't see, stuff that we've been hearing and did not hear about the power of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Wave your hand if you've been getting shooken up just a bit by this series. You need to catch up with the discussion. And I told 8 o'clock, I am literally going to be teaching the grace of God until you start to sweat it. Until it comes out of you. I want you to be sick of me teaching the grace of God. I want you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach it until you say, okay, we quit. Uh, because the grace of God is going to be how you get everything you're going to get from God. You don't have the ability to deserve, to earn, to qualify for anything he wants from you. So it behooves you to have a working knowledge of how the grace of God operates. This morning, we learned something very powerful out of Romans, the 14th chapter. And what we entitled it was Confronting Critical Christianity. It was a very powerful lesson. Because what we learned is there are things that are non-negotiable and then there are things that are preferential. And very often, we are stumbling over things that are non-preferential doctrinal items. Jesus said it like this, if you've never stole the woes of Jesus, study the woes of Jesus, what Jesus said was you guys are batting at flies or gnats while swallowing whole camels. He was basically saying you cannot exaggerate things that are preferentials and make them doctrine. It was a very powerful word. We dealt with dualist theology this morning, hypocritical theology, and why people judge others for not having the same conviction. We can all be Christian and all be going to heaven and not have the same convictions. The word of God does not change, but when you're dealing with individual con convictions, it is very important to not stumble over what your brother does not believe, and it is also very important to not be offended by what you can't get them to see, okay? I also uh, taught this morning that the root of bad conviction is awful teaching. When you are a critical person, I guarantee you, you've had poor teachers, Critical people have been exposed to flawed theology, and it swells in them a judgment base for how to see others. So it's very important that we re-examine this issue of conviction, this issue of what it does at the root level, and the things that we should be bothered by, and the things that we should not be bothered by. Some very powerful things, some very strong things, but you need to do it, because God does want to deliver you from a critical spirit. Mostly and mainly, not just because of how you see each other, but the truth is, if you are a critical person you need to also be set free from self-hatred whether you know it or not the most critical people are critical to you because of what they really think about themselves and it can be buried under a lot of different stuff but I don't know a critical person that likes themselves for real Selah. let's go to Romans the 15th chapter I'm gonna share some things with you now the whole point of the book of Romans is to segue us into a much bigger bigger issue drum roll please oh they left the instrument child Thank you. Guess what I'm preaching on next month? Y'all, I'm Y'all, the spirit of prophecy is moving all over this place. This month's series is called Amazing Grace. And we're going to be studying the grace of God from Genesis to Revelation. It's going to be amazing. I brought one of my friends next week. We're going to move this stuff, have a big old couch up here, and we're going to co-teach. Myself and Dr. Hart Ramsey uh, will be opening this thing up. If, you, if you're not familiar with the ministry of Apostle Hart Ramsey, you're going to be missing it. He and I are going to be co-teaching about the power of grace, the only way out of sin, why the religious spirit responds so bad to the grace of God, and why you're struggling to receive and to believe it. It's going to be a powerful conversation. I, to date, don't know anybody that has a revelation of the grace of God like Dr. Hart Ramsey. So it's going to be an amazing time uh, to sit up and teach that together. Who's at Romans 15? We are at Romans 15. Go to the Living Bible. The Living Bible. I will go on record as a covenant theologian and say the message version is the most hood version of the Bible. It's so ghetto. I mean, I'll be reading through the message. I'm like, y'all might as well just say yo at some point because 
the Message Bible is really, really, really interesting. I'm starting to develop a great respect for the English Standard Version as well. But uh, in reading through the Living Bible, uh, I'm appreciating how the pragmatism and Paul's statements actually are. So this is going to be vitally important for you. Are you at Romans 15 and 1? Romans 15 and 1 says, even if we believe. Now remember what I taught you about the book of Romans. That the last verse of the former chapter is the opening for the verse of the next. If you didn't study it, go home and do it. At the conclude of each chapter, it sets it up for what the next chapter is about to say. So this is an ongoing, a run-on sentence. One of the problems with this, I'm going to read it, is this. If you take the chapter numbers and verse numbers out, you'll probably understand it better. In biblical interpretation, the addition of chapters and numbers fractured how we approached it. Because when you approach it like verse 1, verse 2, you are able to kidnap a verse, alienate it from its context, and not care about what else it meant. If you read it without chapters and numbers, then you probably walk away with a more fuller understanding about what it is, okay? So this is an ongoing thought from Romans, the 14th chapter. Verse 1, even if we believe that it makes no difference to the Lord whether we do these things, talking about meats and festivals and days and sacrifices, still we cannot just go ahead and do them to please ourselves. For we must bear the burden of being considerate of the doubts and the fears of others, of those who feel these things are Wrong. Let's please the other fellow, not ourselves, and do what is for his good and thus build him up in the Lord. Here is the context. The context of Romans 14 and 15 is strong and weak. You can be a believer who thinks you're strong and actually be weak. And you're not weak by what you do, you're weak by what you believe. If you are a seasoned Christian with bad beliefs, you're actually weak. Even if you've been in the church all your life or you, you, you're seasoned by virtue of your experience there, flawed theology is a weakened Christian life. The stronger your beliefs are, the more mature you are in the scriptures, okay? That's the context of this. Look at verse 3. Christ didn't please himself. As the psalmist said, he came for the very purpose of suffering under the insults of those who were against the Lord. These things that were written in the scriptures so long ago are to teach us patience and to encourage us so that we will look forward expectantly to the time when God will conquer what? Sin and death. Now look at verse 5. May God who gives patience and steadiness and encouragement help you to live in what? Complete harmony with each other, each with the attitude of Christ towards the other. And then all of us, can we say that term together? Do it again, say it again. All of us. Now in context, he is talking about Jewish believers, Gentile believers, trying to focus on Calvary and not the culture. It is not about how you grew up and what you thought brought you righteousness because I have faithfully proved that all of that was off and now your focus is Jesus Christ and the cross. So now he's saying, my admonition is that you find a way to put your convictions wherever they need to go for the sake of harmony. If it's going to be that we are all going to name the name of Jesus Christ, then use your convictions to determine your life and to encourage others, but don't use them to criticize others. Let's prove that why that's there. Look at verse uh, 8. Let's go to verse 8, okay? Remember that Jesus Christ came to show that God is true to his promises and to help the Jews. And remember that he came also that the Gentiles might be saved and give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Look at verse 10. We're getting to our thought. And in another place, he said, be glad, O ye Gentiles, along with his people, the Jews. Now, why is he referencing Old Testament prophecies? To, plan, to, to, to prove that unity between Jew and Gentile was never a New Testament idea. It was always the plan of God. Even when y'all were making God a meanie pants, saying that he kills everybody, his idea was still to unify Gentile and Jew, bond and free, both through who? Christ. Without Christ, they could never be seen as one person. But he's referencing Old Testament prophecies to show this is not a new idea. Your understanding of it is new. Just because you're just not understanding it, don't make it new. So when people begin to learn the grace of God and learn the power of the New Testament, what they're going to say is, oh, that's that new stuff. That's that new stuff. But actually, it's as old as the word of God itself. Go to verse 12. And the prophet Isaiah said, there shall be an heir in the house of Jesse, and he will be king, talking about David, over the Gentiles, and they will pin their hopes on him alone. Look at verse 13. 
So I pray for you Gentiles that God who gives you hope will keep you happy and full of peace as you believe on him. And I pray that God will help you overflow with hope in him through the Holy Spirit's power within you. Now how many of you know what a benediction is? A benediction is not the thing you say at the end of a service. When you're looking at biblical writings, it is the conclude of a thought before you move on. Chapters 15 and 16 are the benediction of the Apostle Paul because he's getting ready to go to Spain. He's trying to move into a new assignment, so he's wrapping up the issue to the Romans. In other words, he's dropping the mic. He's saying, I've given you everything I'm going to give you on this, and now I'm going to give it to somebody who does not know this. What was the power that enabled him to move on? Why did he feel like he could stop the discussion here and move on to a new assignment so glad you asked it's in verse 14 I know that you're wise and good my brothers but if you know these things so well that you are able to also teach others about them but even so I have been bold enough to emphasize these points knowing that all you need is a reminder from me hallelujah for I am by God's grace this says special messenger yours might say apostle he's saying I am by God's grace a special messenger from Jesus Christ to you Gentiles look at here bringing you the gospel and offering you up as a fragrant sacrifice to God for you have been made pure and pleasing to him by the Holy Spirit verse 17 so it is right for me to be a little proud of all Christ Jesus has done through me I dare not judge here's where we're getting where I thought wake up I dare not judge how effectively he has used others but I know this he has used me to win the Gentiles to God. Look at verse 19. I have won them by my message and by the good way I have lived before them and by the miracles done through me as signs by God. All by the Holy Spirit's power. We're concluding with this thought. In this way, I have preached the full gospel. I have preached the full gospel. I have preached the full gospel all the way from Jerusalem clear over into Illyricum. I have bad news and then I'm going to tell my story. The bad news is this. If you got saved, how many of you got saved and backslid not too soon after that? Be honest. How many of you guys saved it was in for years before you had a fall or some type of thing? Okay. I'm assuming that the rest of you who are not raising your hand are backslidden already. It's my assumption. In the traditional church context, I want you to hear how Paul was able to move on. The idea is when you get saved, you've got a zeal. You got an excitement. I was there too. You young folk on fire. Okay. And you start your decision on that same said zeal. And here's why that's not biblical. When the apostle Paul talked about a zeal, it was talking about a misdirected zeal at people who were trying to get salvation through works. So he was not talking about the zeal that you and I have about finally being saved by grace through faith. What happens is... We don't make it good enough into Christianity because the gospel we heard was not full. There are great preachers who teach a half gospel. And if the gospel you preach is half, the people that believe it, believe it halfway. And when you believe it halfway, you are filled to a half point. So if the gospel that got you wasn't a full one, then whatever you believe didn't have it in it to help you endure past your first temptation. People don't backslide because they don't believe Jesus is Lord. Matter of fact, most people that backslide believe Jesus is Lord. But when people fall, particularly after being fresh in the door, it's because they heard a half tale gospel. Now you're like, but ain't the gospel the same? Ain't the gospel simply the good news? I'm going to preach to you what the gospel is. 
Here is my story and I'm sticking to it. In November the 30th, 1997, I was filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. I mean, I was filled beautifully by the Spirit of God. And the reason it was such a beautiful thing is because I had no teaching, I had no preaching, I had no relationships that were after the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I had received the baptism of water and literally supernaturally on, on April, it was Easter of 97, my mother and I got baptized together. In that following November, I started to crave the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I was a dreamer, I had visions, I saw things all my adult life. After I started to search out this thing called the baptism of the Holy Ghost, weird stuff started happening around me that started to situate my life around people who had what I wanted. It'll make sense in a minute. So I would randomly meet people who had the infilling of the Holy Ghost and was not in my church. They didn't come from where I came from. They would be in restaurants, they would be in hospitals. I even had substitute teachers that would be strategically positioned. All you got to do is get hungry. It, it does not matter what you got access to. If you develop a desire, God will start strategically placing kingpins around your story to guard you to where you got to go. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. But I wanted the Holy Ghost, and I didn't know why I wanted it because I didn't know how to get it. I remember going into a service. Many of you have heard me say this, and this is pertinent to understanding what I mean. I remember finding some weird people who spoke of tongues and had the Holy Ghost. At this point in my church, in my background, we believe that if you quote unquote shout it, it was the Holy Ghost. It, it, this ain't even a message. This, this, this is going to help you in a minute. I believe that the reason you need the Holy Ghost was so he could possess you in a church and so that you could scream bloody murder when you wanted to uh, praise him. So I believe the Holy Ghost heard it because the way my church taught it was, ah, thank you! And you ran into walls and you roll over yourself and you just could not stop. And so I'm like, man, I would love the Holy Ghost if it makes you more safe, but he looks a bit painful. And, and then, you know, uh, <laughs> seemed like you just couldn't stop clapping. You would have attacks of sort. And then I started realizing, listen, that not one place in the scriptures does the Bible attribute praise to the Holy Ghost. He never says that praise is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. In all of the word of God, praise is an act of the human will. So it does not take the Holy Spirit to praise God. For example, people take out dancing and you be like, all flesh. Well, what else is it supposed to be? It's not the Holy Ghost job to praise God. I feel you kicking and I ain't scared of you. It means you have control. If you want to, when I'm dancing, it's because I want to. If I'm running, it's because I chose to. If I decide to hop, I have not been possessed. I've been reminded. I'm sorry. If the Holy Ghost does anything, it's give me a memory and then I praise on cue because I want to. Please sit down. That was my understanding of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know how else to use the man, okay? I started pursuing stuff, started reading stuff. And when you read stuff, it starts to create faith in you. That reading is a powerful thing. So I started to study. I would go to the library on 63rd and Cottage Grove after school, and I would study the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I started doing what nobody my age should have been doing. I started searching it out. Came across a very small Pentecostal storefront church on 79th and Ashland. And a group of my friends were going there. And I just decided I was going to get on the 4th and Cottage bus, and I was going to go with them one day after school. I'll never forget it. And there was a lady there, a female evangelist there, and she was tearing with the Holy Ghost. I am missionary Baptist so I don't I've never heard the term Terry I've never heard that you had to like do anything of the source to get it mind you in my church the only church I knew in my church you were randomly selected by a lottery he fell on you some Sundays and you start to scream or elbow somebody next to you they came around you to support you and gave you some water so you could cool down and then they walked away so if you had this mentality where you didn't get selected that Sunday then I didn't think I had the Holy Ghost where in this stream it was a little different in this stream you could fast for it you could pray for it you could believe God for it watch me Jerry 
Israel and you could also be turned away from it. So the way it worked was if you went to get prayer for the Holy Ghost and you didn't get it, it meant something was wrong with you. So they would, they would do it for days at a time and, and people would tear it for the Holy Ghost. I don't knock it because I think that that's what people taught in order to do what needed to be done to get people out the flesh. I went to this particular church and the evangelist that was at the top, I was in the line and I was like, God, please feel me. Just please, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how you're going to feel me. And people was falling out, Chevelle, and they was like, you know, quicker. And I'm like, man, this is real. I'm about to get it. I'm like, I'm sitting in there like, I'll never forget it. I had on some K-Swiss and a herringbone chain. I was like, oh, I'm about to get this. Thank you, Chief. Oh, hallelujah. I was, ooh, yeah, I was, I was about to get it. Well, I got midway, and I realized that mother was taking her fingers, and she was slapping folks' tongues. So she was saying, open your mouth, you know, and they were doing like that, huh? and she was hitting it. Wham! And they was, so here's what I did. Midway, I just, So in the middle of the aisle, before I could get to the front, I just fell because I didn't know how else to get out that line without being condemned. I just collapsed, dead smack in the middle of the aisle. So once they came to pick me up, I was like, whoo, whoo. Went outside, got in my cab, I went home. I was not about to let her touch me. One thing I did know, I have a grandmother that's from the military, so I did know that you're not about to touch their tongues and mine. Time is filled with swift transition. None on earth can move, can stand. I don't know where your mouth been. I can't hear you. I don't know where your hands been. This is all a bunch of chaos. Following week, following week, pay attention, this is going somewhere. Following week, I was in my bedroom and I learned the power of desperation. Nobody had ever taught that if you get to the end of yourself, that the only other option is to be filled with somebody else. All of that discouragement, I feel them right now, I'm about to weep. All of that discouragement and you don't need this and that's too much. It brought me to a discouragement that turned into a desperation. I remember feeling like I'm not going to survive somehow without this. So I simply asked God in my bedroom, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Just fill me. If, you, if you're real, you can do it right here. Just please, just do this right now. TV literally is on a channel called TBN. At that time, I didn't know nothing about Paul or Jan, but I see this lady come on, and they turn it to Rod Parsley. And Rod Parsley is preaching. He had a show called The Breakthrough Hour or something. So they would build a bridge of hope. They were in the middle of trying to build a bridge of hope, and they were raising money. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. He points to the camera and says, young man watching this, you are a prophet of God to nations. God wants to feel you in your room right now. I'll never forget it. The hey, the fire of God. Hit, whoo, I'm sorry. The fire of God hit my life so glory. The fire of God hit my life so hard, and the power of the Holy Ghost came in my room. I remember thinking, if you get any closer to me, I'm going to bury myself in this wood. I begin to speak with tongues fluently. It didn't come out choppy and, and like I was struggling. There was a language of the spirit that came upon me, and instantly I knew something was different. I knew something was different. I knew my life was ruined. I knew I was wrecked. Even when, when I talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost today, I get, I get full. Uh, because I remember the desperation that helped me know that what I heard wasn't it. I remember understanding. I appreciate what you said, but there's got to be more out there than I'm wrong and I'm wicked and I'm going to hell. Especially for men that I already know is on their way there. Something more is out here. And God gave me more by myself. Listen. Of course I was in sin. I ain't know no other way to be. Of course I was around iniquity. I know no way to be. But in the middle of that stuff, the power of the Holy Ghost came and filled my life beautifully and it was over. The gifts of the Spirit went to another level. I started dreaming on purpose where it would be on accident. I remember being filled with the Holy Ghost and going to bed and asking God for a question and waking up with a dream to answer. It was so much more. Now here is why I'm showing you this. I was saved by a half gospel. And the half of the gospel was the wages of sin is death. The, then they would get quiet on this part to give God a turn life. But the wages of sin is death. I got saved on the gospel that it's better. Look at this dysfunctional stuff. It's better to have him and not need him 
than to need him and not have them. I'm not making these quotes up. These were what they said to open the doors of the church. So it left me feeling like salvation was an option and that I needed Jesus Christ as a just-in-case policy. It's better to have him and not need him. And there's never a point where I'm going to have him and not need him. As a matter of fact, I've seen the depth of my sin. And the reason I'm anointed is because I know I need him. So they would open the doors of the church. And these are people I love. I grew up in a family church and they would say, is there one? They would be this tug of war over this gospel. Is there one that polar deacon would stand up with his hand lifted as high as he can? Is there one? And you could never get one. And then they would say, I, I want you to know, look at this apostle, I want you to know that you can come by letter or Christian experience. Now most of you are like, I don't know what the heck that is. I'm, this is gonna, it meant that when you joined, if you came from another church in front of all of us, you would have to present a signed letter from the leader you just came from. If you were coming by Christian experience, it meant that you didn't have a letter but you were saved and didn't need to be baptized. Yeah. Then, here was the most horrendous theological brand on me. I'm going to tell you where it damaged me. When you join, no matter if we knew you, if we just shook your hand, if we walked past you, the deacon would ask this. Can I get a motion? I'm not lying. Yeah. Bro, pastor, is there a motion? At the middle of the, am I like, KJ, at the front of the church, can I get a motion? I. And the I was a move on whether or not I deserved to be a part. Oh, I'm, I feel you kicking. Or if anybody back there was going to object to me being worthy enough to be baptized with water. Now, y'all a lot better than me. At these weddings, when these preachers ask, does anybody uh, object? I have never said that. I will smack you in your face. I paid money on this. I don't care who you is. If you object, don't come. Sonia, what it did, listen, early on, was it taught me that whatever God wanted from me had to be agreed upon by them. I, I, I have to say that again. My introduction to your religious self taught me that whatever God has for you must be agreed upon by a council. What it did was it started my journey in God with the fear of man. Thinking, thinking that when and if I said yes to God, if they didn't agree, it couldn't be real. So then after I got filled with the Holy Ghost, the man decides to call me to preach, 1999. This is November 30th. Something about November, because I got you in November, your birthday in November. I got filled with the Holy Ghost in November. I preached my first sermon in November 1999. Something about that month is good for me. So in November of 99, I told my great great granddaddy, hey, I'm called to preach. He said, go back and wait. I want you to wait six months and see if you're serious. I said, okay, fine, whatever. But let me up, let me preach. That was November 1999, right? I got up. And I asked God desperately before I took that mic, if I'm really called, tell them. Now, I've been speaking in tongues and feel the Holy Ghost keeping it a secret, or at least trying to. And he was talking to me like we was BFFs up until this point. I'm like, yo, you calling me to preach? You need to talk. I got a whole little unit here that you need to inform. And when I mean dead silent, I'm like, where are the dreams at now? Where the vision's at now? You're not going to tell him and her and them and no. You're not going to meet with them. What are you coming to me for? And the Lord spoke something to me that set me up for this ministry. I want you to go now and I'm not going to tell them. That's exactly what he said to me. And he said, I'm not going to tell them because I'm going to call you to do some stuff later that they will not understand. Say yes to me now and let them understand later. Literally what he told me. So I had to go into public ministry with the pain of not having the agreement of a well-meaning support system. When you got adults around you and you're a child pursuing the will of God, what they think is keeping you out of it is protecting your childhood. So like, no, you, you got the rest of your life for it. Hold on to that. And I was really trying to throw myself fully into the call of God. And I thank God that I did because I, I probably would not be here had I said no to God then. So I said yes to God. And when I said yes to God, began my preaching career. It's almost 20 years ago now. And I had to get out of that culture. And when I got out of that culture, you know what I realized? The gospel I heard was half. And here's why. I heard who didn't need it. 
what you could not do with it. I understood what would disqualify you from it. Then, when I got exposed to different revelation, things that Jesus says started making more sense. For example, Jesus looks out at the river one day to Jews. And he says unto Jews, he wasn't talking to Gentiles, come to me. They still ain't came to him. He looked at them and said, come to me, all ye that are what? Weary and heavy laden. He was saying, what y'all doing is exhausting. If you have not realized, religion will wear you out. When you are religious, you can be 20 and look 60. They program you to be old and to act old and to age before your time he said come unto me all ye that are weary because you're tired and heavy laden and I'm not going to make you work I will give you rest next verse Dre take my yoke look at the gospel from the one whose idea it was take my yoke I'm going to put a yoke on you and learn of me. Look at this. Because my yoke. Why do you think he's making a distinction? Because you have a yoke already. And the yoke that you have is the old covenant. What he's saying is I have a new yoke. Ha, na, 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 na. And this yoke is going to be easy. Glory to God. And the burden that I'm paying on you is light. Why? Under the old covenant you got to carry it alone. It's light because I'm carrying the majority of the weight. So when you go into religion and traditionalism, there is a weight, a heaviness. There is like a, I'm never good enough. Will I ever be free? Will I ever make it? And if it's heavy, it ain't holy. If Jesus said it was light, then your heaviness is calling him a liar. If that yoke of salvation on you feels heavy, you have a fracture in what you believe something that what you believe was wrong Paul gives us this language in Romans 15 he's concluding it I preach the gospel of grace I told you ain't no difference between the Jew and the Gentile I want the Jew I want the Gentile I want the GD I want the BD I want the gangster disciples I want I want the East Coast praise God I want the West Coast glory to God I want all of them I want all of them and, and I'm done because I fully preached the gospel to you and because I fully preach the gospel to you, I can go on and fully preach the gospel to others. Here is my premise. The gospel, when it is full, it comes with certain stuff. The gospel is not the Bible say in word only. And what you need to realize about your own journey, 90% of us in this room got saved because of words we heard. But the Bible said that that's not the full gospel. If we're supposed to live the gospel out, then that means that there is a presentation of the gospel that comes with certain stuff. And here's what he says in Romans 15. I have fully preached the gospel and it came with miracles. Now, the reason why the gospel had to come with miracles is because if I don't prove what I'm preaching, you're going to make it a philosophy of men. But if I move in power after I preach, then you can't deny my doctrine. Yours don't come with signs. You will know one of the signs of a half gospel is because nothing happens after it. Go to Mark the 16th chapter. Go to Mark chapter 16. I'm believing God that he's going to raise many of you up that's, that, 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 are, that are ministers of fullness. I'm believing he's going to put a call and a cry in the earth for fullness. People that are sick of loving half and, 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 and wanting half and, and being around half and half-hearted relationships and half-hearted covenants and half-hearted holiness. I believe that one of the anointings that's on this movement is an anointing to fullness. When Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he said, if you drink this here, you're going to be thirsty again. But if you drink of what I have, you will never ever be thirsty again I can look at every trap in your life and show an empty area where 
you were trying to fill a void that only God could fill and you ended up in a lying love because the void in your life is God sized and no amount of men no amount of money no amount of achievement no amount of degrees no amount of nothing can fill the hole that God put in you to put him son there Go to Mark 16. Half gospel. Mark 16. Now listen, listen, let me tell you something. If you write a book about me, there may be some error in what you wrote. You could have the gist of it. You could have the main points of it, but you're not going to know all of the details of my particular story. If I write a book about me, then I know everything I saw, everything I experienced, everything that made me. You write by observation, I write by personal experience. The shame of our crisis is that most of what we are teaching about the gospel did not come from Jesus. It came from Jeremiah. Came from Moses. Came from Ezekiel. And while it was right, it was still encrypted. Jesus came out of the earth and pulled the gospel out of encryption and said, if you want to see the gospel, voila. And here's what he told us to say. Mark 16, verse 15. This is the living Bible. Mark 16, verse 15. And he, who is he? Jesus. Is it Jesus? Is it Jesus? And he told them, you are to go into Israel. Uh, the people who worship on Sabbath. Uh, uh, people who don't get tattoos. People who are vegan. People who believe in yoga. I want you to go to all, come on church, all the world. And I want you to do this. Preach the, the good news of the gospel to everyone, everywhere. Everyone, everywhere. That's my life motto. Everyone, everywhere. And those who believe and are baptized will not be working on their salvation. Not be fighting for their salvation not trying to argue for their salvation not trying to prove their salvation whoever believes and is baptized shall be. now the reason I'm hollering on that is because if you had a say so and why God would save me I don't know that I would make it every day of my life I'm grateful that you ain't God every day of my life I'm thankful that you're not on the throne every time I have a mistake or cross a turning point one of the reasons why I'm dancing is because you ain't my deliverer and when God decides to open up my future he's not going to visit you to ask you what you think about it he said everybody that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved look at here but those you ready for me to mess with you a little I'm almost done but whoever refuses to believe, whoever sins, whoever makes a mistake, whoever got angry on the road and cussed, whoever stumped a foot and said, oh, blank, whoever saw a dog run after them and let something come out on accident, whoever got angry and decided they were just going to smack somebody one day. No, 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 no. He said the basis, watch me mess with your religion. The basis of your salvation is not whether or not you sin. If you say, if you accept me, I've got enough blood to handle when you're human. The basis of your salvation is whether or not you believe. He says whoever does not believe is damned. Now, because, look at here verse 17, Amber. There are going to be people who criticize your salvation. And they're going to tell you, you ain't saved. Look at that hair. Look at them shoes. Look at your clothing. It's third Sunday. Why is you taking it on first Sunday? Because I grew up learning that the first Sunday was holy to God. You don't even wear white when you serve in your communion, carnal tail. That's Tom, look at you. And so Jesus is like, they're going to say all of that. But here's what I want you to know. If you preach this gospel 
and if you refuse to exclude people from it, then I'm going to give you certain things that support the gospel. You're not going to go around and give people good news and leave them hopeless because nothing happens. When you preach this gospel for real, things are going to come out of you accidentally. You will have some things that you do on purpose, but when you preach this gospel, your shadow is going to do more than what other people cannot do. Come on, elbow somebody, say, get this gospel, get this gospel. And the reason we have a powerless gospel is because it is not a full one. When Paul said, I fully preached the gospel here's what Paul believed that Jesus said verse 17 is if you believe then you're going to use my authority because the first thing you're going to have to do when you get saved and try to save others uh, is before you confront their education and before you confront their intellect and before you confront their gender and before you confront their clothes and before you confront their sexuality and before you confront their poverty you're going to run in something that's bigger than all of that this is why the Bible said the first sign of those that believe is not that they get proud and not that they get boastful and not that they take their pants off and wear skirts your bible say in my name i feel like preaching right now they will cast out devils he said because of the nature of this gospel when you try to lead people to the lord the god of this age has blinded their mind so if you're going to lead them to the lord you're going to know how to bind the devil watch me and cast him out because the demons are in the way they are interfering with how people hear the gospel but the way they preach it is you hear the gospel first and then you get delivered then but Jesus said no when you are going to witness because your gospel is full then you're going to have people that are going to be manifesting demons of addiction and demons of lust and demons of stagnation demons of rebellion demons of witchcraft demons of addiction demons of Hennessy demons of vodka demons of marijuana demons of condoms and demons of plan B and he's like all of that can be there but I've given you something that can take that thing by the root and cast it out glory to the south which I had a church you cannot have a full gospel and not cast out the devil this is why there's a lot of people who say they are full gospel but they have a halfway hatred of hell that's what makes this church this church a hatred for hell and a hunger for holiness I want to be holy so I cast the devil out come on Zion demons of schizophrenia and demons of rage demons of bitterness demons of unforgiveness demons of lust demons of perversion demons of death demons of damnation even the spirit of death that follows you until you die Jesus said when you get this gospel right I'll give you the power to break open the powers of hell and loose them that's the full gospel now after this he said not only are you going to cast out devils you're going to need a new language because when you were unsaved you spoke one way you thought one way you understood one way there were certain words that would be profane that would come out of your mouth when you were not saved you use your words to fight and you use your words to curse so being the good God that I am when you come over into this gospel I'm gonna take your language out and I'm gonna give you a brand new language because the sign of every culture is a brand new language this is about the sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is speaking with new tongues it's not because God likes Spanish it's because you gotta talk the talk of the place that you come from when you realize you're not from earth and now you've got an acknowledgement that you were born in heaven you now have a heavenly language that can bypass your intellect and bypass your education and bypass what you heard into a tongue that you don't even know and Paul said it like this whoever speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto me glory to God but they speak unto God next verse how be it in the spirit
spirit his understanding is unfruitful watch this when you were not saved you lived your life in your understanding you loved your people in your understanding you pursued your career in your understanding but when you get this gospel the first thing that God calls you out of is not your sin because if he calls you out of your sin and leaves you in your understanding you're going all the way back to your sin the reason you in sin to begin with is because of what you do and don't understand so I need to give you the Holy Ghost so he can pull you up out of your understanding I don't know who I'm talking to in here but it's not until you can pray what you don't understand that you can have what you did not believe you're going to speak with new tongues you can't have a full gospel and don't nobody get filled with the Holy Ghost you can't have a full gospel and don't know tongues ever come out nowhere I mean my God if you're telling folk that you are a full gospel anything and folks are not getting filled with the Holy Ghost you ought to take the sign down it's bad broadcasting a part of the new God the full gospel is when you get saved you don't stay empty when you get saved you get more than principles and more than philosophy you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and when you go in him he comes up in you Jesus said like a river springing up into everlasting life somebody ought to talk in tongue a little bit if you look at your children they talk coloring book they talk ninja turtle they talk Miley Cyrus you ought to lay hands on your children and believe them for the baptism of the Holy Ghost I dare you to pray for your toddlers to begin to speak with unknown tongues and if you get them filled now they won't be empty later we need some filled children we need to stop giving them hot dogs and pork and beans and ask them have you been seized since you believe and pray for them to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and if that wasn't enough he says and after you are filled with the Holy Ghost I'm going to launch you into a new realm of warfare the next verse said they will handle snakes and if they drink any deadly thing it will not harm them now there was a cult that came out in 1965 and they were called the Pentecostal snake handlers so them fools took this text and they started playing with cobras and playing with vipers and most of them are dead to this day because they didn't understand that these snakes didn't crawl these snakes actually walked Jesus said in Luke 10 19 behold I give unto you power woo, to tread upon serpents and scorpions next verse and over all over the powers of the enemy here's what makes me shout and nothing come on now, slap somebody upside the head say nothing means nothing oh baby pumpkin head say nothing means nothing he said and nothing will by any means harm you what was he talking about people with snake tendencies people with reptile tendencies people that act like alligators people that act like bears people that act like pigs now you are in your mind like that's not true because Jesus wouldn't call nobody a pig no yes he did he advised the 12 don't you ever give your pearls to the swine and he was not talking about pigs he was talking about people when Herod came for his life and said I want to kill him Jesus said go tell that fox I'm going to heal the sick and cast out devils and on the third day I'll be perfected everybody acts like the animal they worship what Jesus was saying is when you get this gospel it don't matter how many people betray you when you get this gospel a snake may bite you in business a snake may bite you in marriage but when you've been filled with the right gospel you can be like Paul on the island and have a snake jump out the fire and bite you and you walk away scratching yourself say what was that the reason why so many people uh, get overwhelmed by betrayal uh, is because they believe a wrong gospel Be 
that trail cannot break you uh, when the gospel you heard uh, says all power has been given to me uh, both in heaven and in earth uh, and even under the earth betrayal is a part of breakthrough he told him when you get this gospel right you don't ever have to preach to snakes when you get this gospel right your message is not hijacked by your haters when you get this gospel right you don't waste your pulpit time to prove points to folk who ain't listening that's the problem we are wrestling with snakes instead of treading upon them because when you got the gospel right you don't play with what you rule over you make your enemies your footstool and you rule in the midst of your enemies and you go in the gates that's guarded down it's the power of the right gospel finally it says when you got the right gospel here we go I'm about to offend you because I feel like it Benny said when you got the right gospel you don't make sick and shut in lists he said when you got this gospel right you don't have to take a number to get healing when you got this gospel right and you are a walking demonstrator of the gospel ain't no such thing as a sick line ain't no such thing as a deaf section when you got this gospel right you will lay hands on the sick you don't believe the gospel he said when you got this gospel right you're gonna lay hands on the sick and they will i, I don't have a church under the new custom under, under the new covenant you shouldn't be believing for your healing too long you gotta get around a place where the gospel is active where the gospel is working where the gospel is free to do what it should do and one of the things our gospel does is heal the sick Kitty, my church had a list Every Sunday before we sang a selection, we would read the list. This song is perfectly dedicated. This is Arthurine White, Brother Dave Wilkinson, Convalescent Home, Sister Order May Ellens, who's pregnant. And they would read the list of the sick. And we would sing songs because we had no power. We would sing songs on the Broadway because we would go to bring them communion. But we wouldn't go to bring them the gospel. Everybody that walked up to Jesus for healing got healed on the same day. And there were people that had watched the broadcast. And the son came up to Jesus and said, listen, can you please send the word? And Jesus said, because of your faith, I'm going to be it unto you. What we need is the gospel. And we need the gospel 3D. We need the gospel from heaven. We need the gospel on the earth. And we need the gospel to undo the forces that are under the earth. He said, if you lay your hands on the sick, they will recover. This is my point. Jesus says that to them and vanishes he says this is what I want you to say and if you spend your ministry saying what I've said you won't need to say very much more say what I say this is literally how he said bye because in verse 19 look at what it says and when the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them he was taken up and he sat down at God's right hand that means he gave them their final instructions and he probably knew over several centuries later that we were going to pervert this man's gospel not care about the fact that we don't see power and then judge people who don't say what we do look at verse 20 which is the message and the disciples went everywhere preaching number one and the Lord was with them when you get the gospel right you don't minister by yourself you don't witness by yourself he told them in this context I will never leave you because their gospel was correct although he was physically ascended the Bible said the Lord was working with them. 
How? Look at this. And he confirmed what they said by the miracles that followed their message. The King James said, and the Lord was working with, the, with them, watch this language, confirming the word. He was not confirming the people preaching it. He was confirming the word. He was not endorsing the brand. He was confirming the word. He was not responding to prayer. He was confirming the word. Which means we've got to ask ourselves a fundamental question. If there be no deliverance, if there be no baptism in the Holy Ghost, if nobody understands the power of spiritual warfare, is the gospel I've heard full? Or have I heard a half gospel? When the gospel is full, it comes with its own stuff. It happens. Y'all see it all the time? We hadn't even got up. Let me deal with a religious point of view. Some of you think this is the first message you heard today. Apostle Monique and the Holy Ghost just preached much longer than I ever could. But you religious! So you think the message come at the end of the service when somebody reads. This woman got up and said what every Bible writer has said from Genesis to Revelation. His mercy endureth forever. And the grace of God is there. That is the word. Whatever you felt that made you leap, made you dance. And in that moment, you didn't feel bills. In that moment, you didn't have no symptoms. In that moment, you weren't trying to figure out if you got accepted to this program or if that mortgage was paid. Why? It's showing you a principle. If you can preach what brings the presence of God in the place, you won't ever feel the same pressures as other people. Why? The Bible says, and where the spirit of the Lord is, and where the spirit of the Lord is, not the spirit of the law, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is... See how free you felt? In praise, you ain't feel like you was in no soul tie, no attic. You was just there. You wasn't thinking about how big you was, how small you was. You wasn't thinking about no check. You was just hopping. And many of us felt the weight of our reality when we came out of praise. So when we stopped jumping, we was like, oh, I'm tired. You, oh, that, oh, that headache. Oh, it's hot. In the praise moment, you felt none of that. But when you came out of his presence, the reality of your world hits you. Who you are and what you need and what you don't know. This is what Paul said, by all means, walk after the spirit. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yesterday I was reacquainting myself with some of the principles of the gospel that I grew up on and abandoned. And one of them is this. I'll try my best not to flip if I flip Jaylen you just move to the left T Ty don't I'm not going to kick you all y'all stay there I'll aim towards Kedron okay if I have to cartwheel what wore me out this week in my devotion was this but put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil and I'm like why didn't this why didn't this hit me 20 years ago like it's hitting me now? Because of a half gospel. But he said, put on the whole armor of God. And then because he knew that our understanding was 50%, he broke it down to us. And here is how you put it on. You've got to put on the helmet of salvation. I, I want you every day reminding yourself that you are saved. Even when you don't feel it, you need to know up here that you are saved. Why? When you've got a helmet of salvation, you are not under psychological duress about where you stand with God. You know the word of truth, even the truth that sanctified you. So your helmet is salvation. Now that ain't making you shout. Then he says, I want you to put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm about to connect all over this floor. Because if righteousness is guarding your midsection, then anything the enemy aims at your heart 
concerning who you are and concerning where you're going and concerning how heaven sees you you've been blocked by righteousness he cannot break your heart if you know where you stand in God that ain't enough now in order to protect your head and in order to protect your midsection you got to have the sword of the spirit I'm about to, which is the word of God you can have the helmet on and you can have the breastplate on and have the wrong sword but when you got the word of God you have the ability to bite back the powers of hell not that's just after you but after your children you got to use the right sword when you were using life in the flesh your sword was anger your sword was malice your sword was revenge your sword was retaliation but over in this new testament my sword is the word of God where's me out Courtney then he talks about having your loins girt about. <laughs> and what that really means is to have a belt that holds up your lower garments. And here's why. Have you ever been lied to by your loins? Did you realize that your loins give you a lying message? Your loins say stuff like, lay here, it ain't that big of a deal. Lay here, y'all are two adults. Lay here, all love is the same. Which means that he knew if you were going to live out righteousness, truth was going to have to protect your loins. And the truth of the word of God is my life is not my own. I'm sorry, but I've been bought with a price. Yes, I'm horny, but I'm holy. Yes, you sexy, but I'm sanctified. And if I was gone, I would be on my back. But because I've been crucified, I said because I've been crucified, I'm not going to sleep with who I want to because I'm not listening to my loins. I stopped listening to my loins. I didn't listen to the message they gave me. And if that were not enough, you're going to need something. Because if the enemy knows that you can use your sword, he's going to use, the Bible calls them fiery daggers. He's going to try to use stuff that impact how you see you, how you see others. If he's not going to come up on you body to body, he'll stand at a distance and shoot arrows from afar. If he can't get in your friends, he'll get on Facebook. If he can't get in your family, he'll attack you through folk that don't even know you. If I can't stab you up close, I'll try to shoot you from afar. Paul said, I'll phone him, I got you there. I want you to have a shield of faith. I want you to have a shield of faith. I want you to have a shield of faith that's not rooted in confidence in you and confidence in your gift, but faith is my belief in God and you can't kill me because I know him and you can't stab me because I know him. I know in whom I believe and that's how I stand against what you're shooting at me. Where's me out? He closes it up with this. Then, I want your feet shod with the preparation. If the gospel was what we thought, we wouldn't have needed to prepare for it. He said he wants your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. You've got to prepare for the journey the gospel is going to take you on. Because as you preach the real gospel, you're going to attract persecution from everywhere. A gospel that is not persecuted is a positive message. But it's not the gospel. Jesus said, woe unto you when everybody likes you. He said, woe unto you if they speak well of you all the time. You are wasting your time trying to get them to like you. But then he said, blessed are you. Hey, when men speak all matter of evil against you. He said, blessed are you when men revile you. Go where? Blessed are you when they lie on you and scourge you in their synagogues. He said they're going to talk about you in the church, but it's a sign that you found favor with me. 
The church has always hated who God loves. That ain't new. Looking at these scriptures through an adult life, through a life that's had suffering, and through a life that refuses to rescind my submission, I see these scriptures so differently now. I said this stuff as a child in Sunday school. Be shy with the prayer. But I know what I'm talking about. But the word is nigh thee. Even in my mouth. I knew it. And now, as I'm understanding the grace of God, it's revolutionizing my life. The principle is this. Get your gospel right. The one you're reading and the one you're living. It comes with certain stuff. It is a full benefits package. It should not be exempt from the quality of life. When John the Baptist questioned Jesus, I don't think you're the one no more. I baptized you. I knew you and I used to believe you. I'm the dude that told everybody you was the Lamb of God. Are you the one or should I look for another? Look at Jesus' reply. Tell them the blind see. Tell them the deaf hear. The gospel, the, the poor, look at this. The poor have the gospel preached to them. If the gospel were in word only, it would not be good news to the poor. If you walk up to the poor and say, the good news is you're going to heaven one day if you don't sin, that doesn't change their poverty. See, the gospel is active. The, the good news to the poor is you don't have to be this way. If you believe in Jesus Christ, he is faithful to change your circumstance. That's the gospel. The gospel is not good luck. So that's where harvest is. That's where our churches are not growing. To blame it on all nations is a deflection. We have a bigger ill and a bigger malady and you got a bigger disease than a new church. And that disease is you have no clear gospel. And it has no weight in the spirit. Look around. They're dancing and not delivered. Singing and depressed. Preaching and suicidal. The gospel is not there. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of grace. And the gospel of grace is the gospel of peace. It is one message. And it's Jesus Christ is full of acceptance. Willing that none should perish. That means to die slowly. But that everybody would come to repentance. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, whatever you're trying to do in this culture, we say yes. Whatever oil, whatever power, whatever ability, whatever language you're trying to stir. Whatever dimension you're trying to add to this place, we make space and we make room for it. Lord, we confess to you that because of our own experiences, because of our own beliefs, because of our own teachings, we don't fully understand this, but we are willing. Reveal to us the mystery of grace. Show us how to live in it and how to give it. Show us how to walk in it and show us how to receive it without any political interferences. Finally, Father, make us ministers of reconciliation where we reconcile men back to God through the grace of God. We, may we truly live up to the destined designation of this place that will be the place of grace. And may people's lives, families, futures, hopes, dreams be resurrected as we walk in the grace of God. We love you for this and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. I want you to give the Lord a loud thunderous applause, will you? Oh, come on, praise him. Come on. I want you to praise him. Come on, praise him because he does not run out of grace. I said praise him because he don't run out of grace. He's not going to run out of grace. This is what the unbelievers need to hear I'm believing God for so many souls to get saved today and for so many people to join this church and here's why listen to me very carefully many of you that are saved 
and many of you that are not saved, one of the things I'm believing God to deliver you from is perfectionism. Why are you so hard on yourself? And it's possible to know that you have more in you without hating yourself for not being it. If you don't give yourself the permission to experience God's grace, then your perfectionism is going to work daily to punish you. There is a spirit of perfectionism that operates in this church mainly because of familiar rejection. You see, when you are rejected or abandoned by mom, dad, or support system, what you do is you start working to be good enough so that nobody else will reject you. And what it does is it gives you a hatred of your own humanity. So you're shocked if you don't do it right or you refuse to not do it right. Or if you get a B plus, you're like, ah! You abuse yourself. And if you don't abuse yourself that way, then you enroll in abusive circumstance. So you get lovers that lie to you, jobs that take advantage of you, or friends that don't fulfill you. And it's all a manifestation of the power of rejection. When you begin to understand the grace of God, it will lift the weight of rejection off of your life. And the reason this is so important is because it is the root of addiction. It is the root of bondage. And I want to cast as many devils out this month. <laughs> I said, I want to cast so many demons out this month. I said, I want to cast so many devils out. <laughs> Who are you on mountain? That you should not bow low. Jesus defeated the darkness and he has never lost a battle oh, who are you great mountain that you should not bow low and Jesus has broken the curse yes he has and he has never lost a battle oh who are you great mountain that you should not bow low Jesus is broken Jesus is broken the curse he has never lost a battle lift your hands lift your sibling. and he never will he never will and he never will he never will and he never will Just, just allow yourself for a minute. The Old Testament prophet said this, you will look at mountains with shouts of grace to them. Shouts of grace to them. I believe that when Jesus said, you will say unto this mountain, be moved. I think what he was talking about is reminding, your, reminding the mountain of grace. Stand to your feet real quick. I'm gonna open it up, come on. I want you to get a mountain in your, in your face. I want you to think about something that's in your way right now. Come on, lift your hands. And I want you to think about an obstacle, something that's facing you. And I just want you to say, Grace! You ready? Come on. I want you to shout grace. When you shout grace to a mountain, it is a word of judgment. It is a word of a sentence. Are you ready? Get something in your mind that's fighting you, that's trying to corrupt you. And I want you just to declare God's grace to it. I don't care if the mountain is depression, if the mountain is sickness, if the mountain is disease, if the mountain is fear. You ready? Come on. Lift your voice. You ready? One, two, three. Grace! Come on, say it again. Say it again. Christ. That's how you answer the devil. Christ. That's how you deal with the enemy. Christ. Come on. Talk to that mountain. I've got Christ. Come on, let it free you. Let it free you. 
Let it free you. Every deadline, every timeline, every anticipated outcome that you think you should have had and didn't, grace. God's going to do everything he promised you he would. Even if it doesn't happen when you thought it was, he cannot lie. Hallelujah.